Hi, uh, my name's Ian Battersby. I'm Head of Internal Medicine at Davies Veterinary Specialists and welcome to um, another Davies Out of Hours session. Uh, we're here just down at the Live and Let Live, just down the road from the practice, um, having a beer and this is my colleague Ronan Doyle. Uh, Ronan's Head of Soft Tissue Surgery. We've worked together now for 12, a while, 30, a long maybe time. 13, 14 years. <laughs> so um, we know each other quite well, um, but I'm embarrassed to say that I know a lot about certain things, but then when I pass on cases to Ronan, I'm not quite as sure, or probably I've forgotten a lot of what happens in surgery. So today, you know, we were just going to talk a little bit through, um, you know, surgical assessment, interoperative assessments, and um, you know, just from a, a standard case scenario that you know you guys may come across from time to time as well. So to set the scene, you know, for Ronan, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been referred to an emergency case, a, a Labrador, four years old, and um, I've done all my medic -y nice. diagnostic stuff, found a very quick diagnosis, and um, you know, the, the, we've diagnosed linear foreign body mm -hmm. in this Labrador. Um, so now you're in theatre, the dog's under anaesthetic, yeah. abdomen's open, so you know, talk me through what you, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, the first thing to say is the heart sinks a little bit, linear foreign body. Oh really? Bit, well, you know, it's going to be a bit more challenging than your, you know, your standard I suppose so. dogs eating a bit of plastic or a stone or something. So, yeah. and you just know that coming with that, you have to sort of think through a bit more, you know, where you're going to take that, how that's going to go. Okay. You know, what, what's the specific things associated with, with one of these as compared to a more standard, kind of, you know, foreign body, yeah. Like a, a tennis ball or something. Okay. Yeah, exactly. In what exactly. way? Well, I mean, the concerns are, are, are the, the damage that can be caused by one of these. Okay. Uh, on what they can do, and, and it's that challenge that, um, as the free end of the, the foreign body runs into the intestine, yeah. it gets caught somewhere upstream. Yeah. Now, classically, you hear about in cats they get caught around the base of the tongue, and in dogs, you know, not normally that normally get caught somewhere in, in, in the stomach. Okay. Now, cats and dogs can go either way. Actually, you can you want to always check the base of the tongue area. But it's often it's that the way they get caught upstream means that the free end runs down into the intestine. The intestine, you know, does what it should do. It's trying to pass that thing down, mm -hmm. but it can't because it's caught somewhere upstream. So the intestine then starts to really bunch itself up over the, the foreign body, the, the mm -hmm. bit of string, say, or whatever. And <clears throat> um, and you get the sort of accordion effect of that. Now it's that's like, often the thing you, you, you might see, say, on your x-rays initially yeah, yeah. or ultrasound or something that sort of suggests that. That diagnosis, and then as it as it keeps trying to push it down, but it can't, it, it bunches up over the intestine. It keeps contracting, and then it starts to to um, uh, to, to really embed the foreign body into the wall of the of the gut itself. Yeah, and that can even go to the point where that starts to rupture the rupture, rupture the intestine. So I mean, essentially, what's happening is that as the intestine grabs onto the string, it's the intestine starts becoming almost like this scrunchy. Yeah, exactly for her bands, and then. Because it gets tighter and tighter, it then starts to, well, you know, start to damage and pull through. Yeah, and it nearly starts to sort of saw through, yeah. you know, um, or saw itself through okay. the, you know, the intestinal wall. And that happens in the hardest bit of the intestine to see when you're looking at the intestine. It's not yeah. on the the outer surface, it's on it's that on mesenteric side. side. Yeah, it's on that fat side. So, so, so how do you, you know, so we, we know it causes problems in that way. So, yeah. I mean, how do you go about assessing the damage, and how do you? I mean, yeah. do you pull it all out or do you have to? Yeah, I, I, this is the thing, and, and you've got to watch these really carefully because the damage is really hard to assess initially. Yeah. And the first step when you get in there is you want to consider, well, wh where's it caught? Where's the upstream bit? You know? okay. um, and in dogs, that's very commonly going to sit just in the pylorus. Because okay. what, what happens is, you know, they eat some string, they don't feel great, mm. they maybe eat some grass and other bits and pieces. It gets wrapped up in that, and it's <clears throat> not so much the string itself, it's the what it gets caught around, okay. which holds it then in the, the, catches it upstream, catches it in the pylorus. So that bit can't move through, but then the free end moves further down. So okay. with linear foreign bodies, it's all about trying to find the upstream bit. Oh, okay. You've got to release that first. Okay. Because once you've released that, that's yep. going to take the, the tension off the, the bit that's, oh, that's caught down okay. there. Yeah. And, that, and that's often a mistake because people work, you know, middle or, or further down and oh, then yeah. they work their way up. Yeah, to, yeah. And, and that's a problem because you're not going to release that tension and that problem, okay. you know, which is the reason why it's become an issue is because it's caught to yeah. So you release the tension, that allows everything to slacken out and I yeah. guess the blood supply starts to re-establish itself. Sure, and, and then it allows you then to really carefully see, yeah. you know, where 
is is there damage or not now you still need to remove the 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 foreign body which is there you okay. know the, the the bit that's caught in the stomach say you'd make a, a gastrotomy yeah. to get in there okay. and the bit in the intestine you'd want to make uh, one or two or maybe more enterotomies over lengths of the intestine to, to then get in um, you know uh, and remove a section of that of okay. that foreign body as it sits there and and what about I mean what are your um, I guess Benchmarks for assessing. I mean, because there may be some yeah. scenarios where you have to actually remove part of the intestine. Yeah, so, what are you yeah. looking for? What the? I mean, that's, that's it. I, essentially, I, I don't make a, a, an initial decision about whether I need to remove intestine. Okay. Apart from, there's a significant number of these. You know, 20, 30 percent in some studies where actually, when you open them, <coughs> they've already ruptured. So, oh, okay. so you already see. So you're already committed. Yeah, yeah and, and I mean they're concerning cases because they're in septic peritonitis <laughs> now. You know, yeah, there's yeah. all that that sort of comes with that too. So, so they're major major concerns. And, and if there's real bad damage to areas of intestine, you may need to yeah you may need to resect those areas. Okay. Um, but the first thing for me is about well I say deal with that upstream bit. Okay. So if it's say base of the tongue, you, you cut that and it sort of pings on down the esophagus. Okay. Or if it's in the in the stomach, you, you do a gastrotomy. Okay. Um, and the thing actually about gastrointestinal surgery, it's all about it's all about control. It's, it's staying in control of the surgeon. Okay. You know, so it's a and that can be a challenge. You've got to prepare yourself for that beforehand. As you open the abdomen, you know you're going to open into the gastrointestinal tract. It's a contaminated environment. Um, whereas you're hopefully, if it hasn't ruptured, you're in the clean abdominal cavity. So you have to think about well, having instruments you're going to use for that dirty bit of surgery and then instruments you're going to use to close the abdomen afterwards so you don't so keep it all keep it you know yeah, yeah. keep things um, as aseptic as possible um, <clears throat> you want to try and control the incisions you make into the intestine so that you know you just don't get stuff you know you make an incision so, and all just <coughs> leaks everywhere and is there any particular I, I suppose it depends on the foreign body doesn't it mm. size of in, in incision but direction yeah or? Uh, yeah I mean, classically, we just make these as a linear longitudinal. Longitudinal, incision. yeah, but, okay. but often quite small. I mean, you don't need to make a really long incision because it's literally a. It's just a bit of string, isn't string, it? String, yeah, yeah. Okay. But where you'll find it is, is often on the on the mesenteric side. You know, the okay. the, the, the far side from where you've made the incision on the okay. on the on the other. You know, the 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 anti mesenteric side. Okay. Um, but then I say even just when you're just thinking about making that incision, you want to try and control that so that. You know, when you make the incision, you're not going to leak a whole lot of ingester into, into the surrounding the area. Yeah, okay. or oh, into the abdominal cavity. Yeah. So, okay. so you know, we'll put uh, moistened uh, swabs yeah, in yeah. around it. Often the big laparotomy swabs are yeah, great yeah. to have in the practice. You can put them in, pack off the area. For the stomach bit, we we probably would put some little stay sutures into the stomach, so little tagged sutures into the, the stomach. Oh yeah, so to keep it all yeah, keep elevated. It up, yeah, elevated yeah, yeah. so we can. Again, it's all about control. So yeah, okay. Trying to, that's often the challenge in surgery, it's actually trying to maintain your control of the environment. And, okay. and sometimes of yourself, I mean, because you, it's a, occasionally a panicky moment there, you <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah. I might not show that, but I mean, that's, that's that <laughs> panicky moment. Calm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but that's all about just again, just keeping, keeping it keeping nice under and control. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just trying to keep in charge of the, of the processes and, what, and then just thinking clearly through, okay, this is what I need to do next. This okay. is where I go next step. So, I say classically for the linear and foreign body is, You've thought about all that planning, the clean versus contaminated and working yeah, yeah. your instruments, packing things off, and then you commit to the incision, say into the stomach if it's caught there. You find where the string is going out, the pylorus, you cut that. So release you the tension. Release the tension. You therefore remove the bit that's been caught in the stomach, so that comes out. And then you come further down, and you've sort of worked out, well, over what length of the intestine, intestine it's in. Yeah, you know, yeah. Is that over the first proximal third of that or is it potentially even going all the way down into mm. the colon because they can do that um, and then you'll make an incision you know a, a reasonable length down maybe distal duodenum or something yeah, yeah. make a small incision try and find that bit of string lift it up cut it remove the section between that and the stomach yeah and, and you're then, basically and taking then, it out yeah work it down yeah okay. and you try and make as few incisions as possible ideally yeah. uh, mostly because look the more incisions you make the higher risk you might have that one of those might have a healing yeah. problem yeah, yeah. Have an issue. Okay. Um, and then um, but on the other hand you want to remove it all as well you know yeah, so yeah. you just you just work it slowly you don't drag these things out you do it very gently you let the tension just relax in the tissues yeah and definitely. then once I've sort of got it out 
that's when I may really carefully then look and see, you know, what the what the damage, damage might have been. Like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and that may not be obvious. And actually, I don't poke and look for for damage either. Okay. It's clearly torn open. Well, then, then we I, may, I will resect that portion. Yeah. Okay. On the other hand, if <clears throat> if it's not obviously torn, but it's like maybe a little, little bit a little bit of inflammation on in the area, I'll probably sit tight and hope that actually yeah, be okay. the normal healing process will, will actually okay. close that down. Yeah. And I guess um, seeing that, that that moves us nicely on to yeah. you've made a hole uh, to remove your foreign body, mm. or you might have removed a section, yeah. and you need yeah. to oppose those edges. So yeah, yeah. there's a couple of things to consider, isn't there, about to, to hopefully minimise the risk of dehiscence, which is yeah. what we're going to worry about afterwards. Yeah. So what 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 are those things? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So those are, ultimately those are technical issues. You yeah. know, technically, what do you do? How do you handle the tissues? What suture material do you use? Yeah. How do you handle that? How do you handle the the um, you know the intestinal edges? You know how do you place the sutures? And I mean you know that's pretty well understood and yeah. and uh, and thought about now. But I mean essentially you're looking for closing of the intestine, yeah. normally using full thickness intestinal sutures to try and oppose the the intestinal wall edges. Okay. The whole aim is to try and engage the key layer of the intestine. If you remember right here, under our days. Absolutely. <laughs> you go, you, you, it's the submucosal layer yeah. that holds the, um, ho ho holds the suture. That's the layer that has the strength. It's got the co collagen rich layer. And you want to get a, a bite of at least three millimeters, maybe more, maybe five millimeters of intestinal wall. Okay. Um, uh, on either side. Either and, side. So, yeah. so imagine that's the, the wound. You want three millimeters, three meters. And, and then we oppose, yeah. Okay. And you don't want those, you know, tie that, that suture so tight that's like strangling the tissues. Yeah. You don't want it so loose that there's like a gap there. So just, okay. just trying to get the tension right to so just hold them in that position. Yeah. And you can then close those with interrupted sutures, you know, space maybe three to maybe up to five millimeters apart, okay. know, depending on what the intestinal wall is like. Um, or you can do that with a continuous closure pattern either, you know. So there's no... Um, is a variation between the type of suture pattern that you use? No, I mean, e either is actually fine, and, and okay. essentially from studies, it's, you know, there's, there's no, no major way. concern if you use one or the other. It's a bit quicker to use a continuous suture pattern, yeah. as long as you're placing it properly in the tissues, as long okay. as you're not so good at either end, it's yeah. fine. And again, so the other key thing, <clears throat> and historically there's lots of stuff about like using inverting or everting suture yeah. patterns and two layer closures and all yeah. that. I mean, it's all historic actually, and it, and it relates to the days when um, there wasn't great suture material, right? yeah, yeah. you know, so, you know, people are using cackle, that sort of stuff, and, yeah, yeah. you know, no one uses that or shouldn't yeah, use that these days. So yeah. you're, you're using, you know, a modern uh, monofilament um, absorbable suture, okay. you know, which is going to hold the tissues for long enough for them yeah. to heal. Okay. And they heal pretty quickly. I mean, you're looking ultimately that you'll have initially for any intestinal wound, you'll have this initial um, period of inflammation. Yeah. Um, and this is the whole thing about coming out far enough from the wound edge because yeah. that area of inflammation spreads out from where you made your incision out to the where your suture is placed. And it, inflammation, you know, there's lots of enzymes and cellular activity occurring in yeah. in that in those tissues, and that degrades the the, the collagen. Yeah. So it degrades the strength of the tissue in which your suture is placed. Okay. So we know this. I mean, studies that were done 20, 30 years ago that if you place those, those sutures too close to the edge, so within a millimetre or so, there's a high risk that they can just tear out through okay. weakened collagen in the <coughs> submucosa. Which I suppose fits with, I mean, because sometimes we get cases that have had intestinal yeah. surgery um, and they've dehissed and they present with peritonitis. And I, I, yeah. I do recall, because I do listen sometimes, <laughs> that you'll comment that you know, there's, there's actually you know, a suture, you know, a ligature actually intact that's just... Yeah, really yeah it's, just, it's just literally it's just torn off it's just torn side, out, yeah. and that's purely because yeah. they're not, well, the suture's just not gone far, in, you know, yeah. far enough. Yeah, I mean, that's it. That's it. It's, it's a common technical error, yeah. placed too close to the edge, not coming out far enough from that wound edge, okay. and then it being caught in that zone of inflammation, and essentially that, that the inflammatory phase is going <clears> to <throat> you know, be over that first, <clears throat> particularly three to five days, and when you look at the studies of when an intestinal incision dehisces or breaks yeah. down, it normally happens within about day three to five. I mean, that's normally that's when because they because of the inflammation. Yeah, and, that, okay. and they, it's, it's the sutures then pulling out of actually just, you know, weakened yeah, yeah. Uh, tissue. Now, look, there's still a risk of that. I mean, yeah, even yeah. if you 
perfect with your placement, and you know, there's still a risk, a baseline risk of deviance yeah. occurring. You know, that risk is somewhere between, depends on the studies and the patients and so forth, probably somewhere between 5 to 15%. Yeah. You know, you're hoping down around the 5%, yeah. but there's still a risk of that. I suppose trying to, again, emphasising that, getting that, that suture bite. Yeah. Far enough out. Far yeah. enough out is yeah. going to reduce that to closer well, to the 5%. Exactly. And it, yeah. you're trying to work with the normal healing processes, okay. really trying to yeah. um, maximise the chances that it heals yeah, you yeah. Know, effectively. Okay. And that's again all about pattern and it's technique stuff. It's pattern, suture material, yeah. it's where you place it, it's how you place it. You try and minimise the amount of damage you do to the intestinal wall because, yeah. again, more damage, more inflammation, more problems, you know, higher yeah. risk of dehiscence. And then once you've, once you've placed those, um, I mean, after about day five, six, th th um, you start to get the fibroblasts in the, in the wound. They start laying down collagen. Okay. And then the, the strength of the tissue starts to really increase, you know, as, the, as it starts to lay across the, the wound. Um, and then ultimately the suture isn't needed anymore because essentially the, the tissues have, tissue have, have already taken healed. over. Yeah, okay. taken that. Yeah. So, so after like day seven, eight, nine, yeah. you know, the risk of dehiscence should really be dropping down very rapidly. Okay. Yeah, for these patients. Right. One of the challenges for linear foreign bodies though is that often they're already very inflamed because of the trauma that this thing has done to the intestine already. And, okay. And, and actually the risk of dehiscence or problems are actually, I suppose, ultimately mortality with those cases okay. is, is higher than what you because see generally with a, with a standard, say, simple foreign, foreign body. body. Yeah. Because there's more inflammation, more yeah. damage, more yeah. likely of dehiscence. Yeah, and probably also Many of those dogs often quite a hard, you know, diagnosis to make for some of them. You know, you, you see so, these dogs. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. They can get messed easily, yeah. and then present at a lot later point. Yeah, yeah. And then definitely. they've got a lot of more. Yeah, they're, they're they're a lot worse kind of body condition. The intestines are going to be unhappier because it's been there longer. Yeah. Um, so that all makes not only yeah that makes the healing process a bit yeah. more challenging. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. which I suppose leads us nicely onto the post op. Um, and uh, what we'll probably do is, um, for, yeah, yeah. Rona needs another beer, uh, even though he's been talking a lot. Um, so what we'll do, in, we'll do a part two, and in part two what we're going to do is uh, create a plan for this patient that's just had that kind of surgery and go through all the things that we need to consider and look out for. So um, that will be released shortly. <laughs>